So our daily schedule at St. Mary's is as close to the rule as I had found in my location search. Basically, we get up at about 4.35 with a hand rung bell, and we start in the chapel with vigils at 5 a.m. every day. Vigils normally last an hour, unless it's a solemnity because we chant 12 psalms, and then we have various readings. We stay in the church after vigils because since we share the church with a, a community of nuns, we're blessed with, they have their own adoration private time and ours is in between vigils and lauds every morning. The bell is rung in the church and that signals to, the, to our wonderful nuns that it's their turn to come into the church to join us for the great morning prayer or lauds. After that, still in silence, all of this is in silence, we go and process to the refectory where we eat breakfast in silence. We then have until mass at 9.30 for a period of recollection and longer private prayer called Lexio Divina. 9.20, the bell rings and we ring that early just to let people know it's time for mass. And so usually the monks will then go, they'll prepare for the mass. At the end of mass, still in the church, uh, both communities pray the office of terse as part of the mass. And then when it is over, the monks process directly into the chapel room where we have our daily chapter. And there we read the rule of St. Benedict, which is read in its entirety three times a year. And the superior might at that time give a short brief talk on a certain part of the rule or on spirituality or on something that we need, um, he thinks, to think about for the day. After that is over, the daily work period begins, the first one. During that time, we all take turns cooking, so someone will cook, we do house chores, uh, if we have classwork that we're doing, because for a monk, formation and intellectual study is never over. It's for the rest of your life. Um, we might do that. If uh, you're a priest, you might be preparing a homily. It just depends on what your daily schedule is like. After that, when the bell is rung, we proceed again, or to the chapter room to get ready for sext or noon prayer. That's again with our sister community and we pray that in common. And then after that, this is a very beautiful part of Benedictine life because we all work our way towards our eternal life. We read from the necrology, which is a book where we remember all of the deceased members of the Subiaco congregation of Benedictine monks and nuns. So every day, the people who have preceded us in life are, are reviewed and we go over them and pray for them. After the necrology is read, we process in rank from the church to the refectory to eat our main meal for the day. St. Benedict emphasizes the importance of the refectory as well as the church itself so when you go into a Benedictine monastery, you'll see that it in a way is set up a lot like the inside of a church with a head table, a crucifix, and then the tables for the monks and nuns behind it. After lunch is over with, we have a little bit of free time, usually an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. Some people, like myself, take a nap, others will right family members, do whatever they need to do. It's our free period of the day. The bell is rung for the hour of known or mid-afternoon prayer. It's a rather short office, but it prepares us for the coming of the day and also helps us to remember that important three o'clock hour, the hour in which our Lord passed away on the cross. So for our more intensive manual labor, which is afternoon, Sometimes I'll go out with one of the other monks and we help to work on forest conservation and keep up the grounds of the twin communities. Or we might work in the garden because we do try to eat 
whatever we produce by the work of our hands, which is very important the rule of Sindhindic. Some monks will spend their afternoons dealing with community matters if they're a superior or the seller, which is in our day, the business manager of the Abbey. Um, he will go through the books, make sure everything's okay. If he has to deal with the bookstore, he'll take care of things at that time too. Another area is our guest house, which we always um, want to make sure that we maintain and keep up. St. Benedict is very specific in the rule regarding guests. Every guest who comes to the monastery, no matter who they are, is to be treated as if they were Jesus Christ himself. So we try to treat those people as we would want to treat our Lord if he showed up here at St. Mary's Monastery. Underneath our guest house is the monastery or Twin Communities Library where we have thousands of books that we keep in spirituality, theology, and philosophy. Our daily work usually ends at 5.45 during the week, and that's our time to get cleaned up and get ready for evening prayer. After that is over, we spend more time in Lexio Divina, which is divine or sacred reading. Um, that's a very important point because that's a Benedictine charism that's specific to the Benedictine way of life. This idea of reading the Bible, not for historical accuracy or anything else, but just reading it to see if one word might literally pop out to you and for you to ponder and think on and see what Almighty God really has in store for you in particular. After Lexio Divina is over, uh, the bell is rung and we go to eat a collation Part of the rule of St. Benedict, again, that we, we make this kind of just a light thing to end our day with. Then we have recreation. We're blessed in this community that we're able to sit there and talk about different aspects of our life, our day, our history. When that's over with, we proceed to the church again for Compline or night prayer, the end of our day. That started with an examination of conscience. It ends with a prayer for us, hymn to Our Lady, depending on what season it is. And we are very blessed at, at St. Mary's and St. Scholastica's to where this is always done in, in, in darkness, similar to how it had been done historically because the Psalms are memorized at that point. And then the superiors, the prioress and the superior of the male community alternate each week and bless all of the monks and nuns um, with holy water before we prepare for bed. My life was centered around God during my early life, during my childhood. We were, as a family, devout Protestants uh, in the Southern Baptist type of lineage. During my period in high school, our, our state and our school was sued because we were still part of a group that had student-led prayer at certain activities. And our school, thanks be to God, fought to keep that in our school's life all the way to the Supreme Court. And that's something that I will forever know God had his hand on me and on our school. and still kept saying to him, Stephen, don't forget I'm there. Love me for I love you. After I graduated, I decided to go to a college in Deep East Texas, and it was in the most awkward place possible that I found the Catholic Church. I was at a party one night with some friends, and there was a young man there who was talking to me about who founded the Catholic Church. And he was Catholic and he said that St. Peter did. And I just looked at him and I just said, no, Jesus founded the Catholic Church. And he kept trying to tell me Peter did and I kept responding, no, Jesus did. And after that, on the way home that evening, my mind logically just said, Stephen, if 
our Lord Jesus Christ founded this church. Why aren't you there? So the next day I looked up in the city, the local Catholic church, and I went and I found the priest who would be one of the most influential figures in my life who helped bring me to our Lord in the fullness of the truth, our Catholic faith. This idea that had always been part of me when I was younger to be, as Southern people put it, a preacher, kind of grew in me and I began to wonder, well, what about the priesthood? I was a new Catholic. You know, I'd been Catholic for two or three years at this point, and you know, that, that newness and that beauty of the church had really grown in me. And I went and discussed it, and eventually I went and studied in Lincoln, Nebraska. However, while I was there in the seminary, I began to love more and more the idea of prayer with my brothers in evening prayer or vespers and morning prayer in lots and mass in community. And I thought that idea of communal life was just so amazing. You always had your brothers to, to clean with, to joke with, to be around. And being new to the faith and in the southern part of Texas, I had never found any sort of religious life. So this little thought began to gnaw at me. And after a couple of years in formation for the secular priesthood, I decided I needed to stop and think more about what God was calling me to do. I did what I thought every bit of research that Stephen could do to find this place in life where I was called. You know, it was going to be the perfect monastery for me, this, this idea of what I needed and wanted. I, from my formation days at the previous monastery, kept hitting on this one part of the rule of St. Benedict where he says it's unthinkable that a monk should pray less than the entire Psalter in one week, which the hermits of the early Christian period did every single day. That stuck with me. I wanted something that I was able to find spiritually that made me grow. So doing my search, I found Plusford and Abbey, which is our mother house in Scotland, where they pray the entire Psalter in one week. It looked perfect for my spirituality. It looked perfect for what I had been praying for. I was like, God, you've given me this place. And then the pandemic hit. And the prior there, who I'll forever pray for and think, said, have you looked at our daughter house? I said to myself, what daughter house? And that's how I found St. Mary's this Benedictine community of monks that I had never heard of, even though I had searched my entire life and it just felt right. So I ended up talking to the community and visiting and making my month long observership and God led, led me here.